Awa <laughs> wheel. Fantastic. Hello. You'll have to let us know, everyone, where you are listening from today, because we always get some people that are from far corners of the world. Uh, that's our, all the travelling that we're going to get in lockdown. So let us know. <laughs> Just letting everyone in. We've got a nice full Zoom launch tonight. If you think that you've got a bit of static, uh, just try muting and unmuting. You don't have to be silent, yeah. <laughs> but um, otherwise, there's no social aspect of the Zoom, so you are very welcome to, to chat. We are almost all in. Linda, I Linda, yeah. <laughs> We've got Darkest Lincoln, Lincolnshire, Stockport, our classic. I'm sort of Stockport. Um, Deepest Devon, I love how people are saying dark and deep. Uh, Liverpool and Chicago. Okay, I don't know who that is, but maybe just while I introduce, could we do mute um, and then we'll eliminate whoever's got the, the background. Has someone got two Zooms quite near to each other, like in that, the same room? Because they could have hell round. Mm. It could be a little bit of an echo. I've had that before. It sounds all right at the moment. Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, well, welcome to this evening's Zoom launch. Um, we are delighted to have you. It's going to be something a little bit special because we've got some fantastic actors joining us tonight. Um, and I'm very excited to launch Sarah's collection today. Also something a little bit different because it's not a traditional chapbook, it's a long narrative poem. And we're retelling the story of Medusa in, for a feminist modern age. So very exciting and delighted that we've got a lovely female uh, <laughs> launch with lots of actors for you. So definitely bringing that feminist vibe for you this evening. So I wanted to introduce Sarah Wallace for you tonight because Sarah can't blow her own trumpet and that's what I'm here to do. Uh, so I'm from Fly on the Wall Press, my name's Isabel. Um, and Sarah Wallace, I was delighted when she submitted to her manuscript to me, I think it was last year now. Um, she's a poet and a playwright and she's based in Scotland at the moment. Uh, she has an MA in creative writing from U. UEA and an MPhil in playwriting from Birmingham University. She's had many theatrical residencies, including Leeds Playhouse, which is an amazing theatre if you ever get to go, and Harrogate Theatre as well. And recent publications include the Yorkshire Poetry Anthology and Watermarks for Lido Lovers and Wild Swimmers, and Best of British and Irish Poets in 2018. So we're going to hear from a very seasoned and lyrical poet this evening. Um, I'd like to introduce to you our actors for this evening as well. So we've got the lovely Helen Buchanan, Sophie McWannell, uh, Rachel, and <laughs> Rachel's not got her last name on Zoom, so she's thwarted me instantly. <laughs> it was all running smooth until that point. God, Rachel, I've unmuted you so you can tell me your last name again. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. And the lovely Rachel Watson. And we've got Fiona Egan, who is not on my screen at the moment, but she is waving. Uh, she's called Scott Warsfold tonight <laughs> on her iPad. Um, <laughs> so it's great to have them all this evening. Um, I hope I've not missed anyone off. Uh, so basically, as we go along, um, we are just going to hear from all uninterrupted. Um, and then um, at the end, if you have any questions uh, for Sarah about the book, um, or you'd like to know where you can hear more about it, we'll do that then. Um, but because it's a long narrative poem, we didn't want to interrupt the flow for you. Um, so without further ado, I think everyone is already on mute. Um, but if you are not, um, now is the time. Um, and we are going to begin this evening's performance. Medusa Retold. Uncaged from the sweep of the sea, a fragile and unexpected thing is thrown onto the beach. Anger at displacement lashes out the only thing that's free. 
Investigators come to see the lights that we might call lungs. Landlubbers and their young draw close. A small girl trips and falls, giving her armpit to cradle a jellyfish, both gasping on the sand. Torchlight and silence fall on the wobbled mass of tangled girl and tentacle. They breathe the shivered tide. To revenge themselves, and show the girl what protection of the pack meant, they cut the jellyfish, which had acted on its nature, as each took part in theirs. But for all the puzzled science, they only found a transparent, dying on the beach, and they couldn't find the lights. The girl, Nula, pulls to her feet and drags in the sand. Her mother would drag her, furious by her hair if there weren't so many snake eyes watching, smothering giggles, pointing and judging. She's embarrassed, has never known how to handle her headstrong girl with her outsized feelings for the sea and her cool eyed creatures. Not for her the domestic comfort of a cat or a charming puppy to cuddle, but cold blooded reptiles kept in temperate tanks staring in violet, all hooded eyes and hisses and ovulating tongues like her. They are creaturely, primal with desperate, cold, strange furies, burning within and waiting to burst forth. And her mother knows things will just get harder. There's no one at home to lay down the law and she's just too tired to do it anymore. Our girl, Nula, she's growing up spiky does things her own way and won't be told. The girl who found a jellyfish lying on the sand and protected it with her own brand of loyalty cries fealty to the sea, finds her own way to be creaturely, stands alone with her snakes and iguanas, salamanders and newts, reptiles of all stripes, won't have parties, won't make friends. Her mum doesn't know the half of what goes on, closes her eyes to it, Hopes and prays one day her strained daughter will come back to her side. She's older now, a punk princess in a sea green tutu and purple glitter Doc Martins stomping across the rocks in hobnailed fury at some schoolyard injustice. A roaring girl, shouting, singing out loud, screaming appropriated pain. Sure, she's had it rough. So what? plenty have it worse, but she's never known how to keep quiet, how to play well with others. Her sense of fair play and natural justice, a lonesome mystery to the other girls and boys. Goading this latchkey kid, whose mum has to work two jobs to keep body and soul together. The father long gone, Italian itinerant, idealist and dreamer, Alessandro for the summer left her mother Kathleen holding the baby and Kathleen is still holding on, calming her rages, holding back her hair as she throws up again after nightclubs and pubs and all the growing up stages. So she's 17 at last, at one with the sea, her sea caged voice letting loose in a band but they won't let her sing. Employed as a dancer, soon discovers a talent for mad-eyed drumming skills, sticks and dreads flying out her head, beating out a rhythm, keeping them in time, two, three, four. Bandmates Athena is well impressed with her, signing out, singer, songwriter and lead on guitar. She's never let anyone else in or let them go so far. The li rhythm leads them on, they lose themselves in it. But Athena has a problem that no one will acknowledge strums a riff or two, stoned by 2 p.m. and the band's got no further than her dad's old garage. Nula takes charge, kicks out all the rest. Their sound is changing, ranging further. They get some bookings and are gonna be the best. Do the birthdays of all her schoolmates. So they want to be friends now when they see her up on stage and have to admit, oh yeah, she's cool now. Athena laughs with her, is completely on her side, calls them the Medusine La Compagnia, the company of jellyfish. It takes her back to the scene on the sand, on the beach, all reconstructed memory. Kathleen has told the story so many times, the girl and the jellyfish, the crowd of one mind. But it's alluring to be the cool one, the one they all want to be. The boys come on strong, 
and so do the girls. She's got big life choices now. Does she want to be one of them or work on revenge? There's Rolo and Ronnie, goth twins in androgyny she finds so intriguing. The alpha girl she has so firmly set against. The lone outsider suddenly become interesting to the whole cast of bored English seaside town youth. Jackson, Penny, Sadie, Rick, April and Lissa. Oh, Lissa, the ex, the stony eyed minx that can still flip her heart. She's been at odds with them for years, temperamentally, culturally, politically, sexually, and now they find her interesting again. She wishes she could think straight, but her internal song just wants, Lissa, Lissa, Lissa. Let and dress for the old lie of affection between us and dressed in your mother of pearl for the eccentric caught in the rain for friendship once held tight for the woman, for the mother of pearl, for the woman on her way to the seaside and dressed in her mother's pearls who insists on dancing the beach in a long ball gown and barefoot but otherwise utterly unsuited to drag through the surf, insulted till taffeta, mermaidic silk wrap, bladder wrapped, led and dress for the footprints, dressed in loose ropes and losing mother of pearl, creeping over broken clamshell, fish guts and old abandoned barbecue. Filthy sanded Luca of muscle instep. She's lost her mother of pearl. Barbs of jelly and odd squares of cuttle. Crying with laughter as a white wave knocks her down. To sit in the sharp sand, building lost castles. The future sobs away, a while searching. Searching out lost mother of pearl. The veiled glint of bright dream till shipwreck come again and again and ebb again the wild. The school, <sighs> the school are on a scuba trip and the band is going too. Nula's got Athena as a partner, the only one she trusts to go down to the ocean bed. They listen to the coach assembled in their gear. No one is playing up. They understand and have things clear. Nula and Athena are first to go under. The experienced divers, the others watch them carefully and take their cue. And then it's off into the blue cold aquarium to see what they can see now, only half an hour from tragedy. It's Athena that gets into difficulty and pulls on the rope. Something's wrong with her air supply and she's starting to choke. Panic kicks for the surface. Nula's got her ankle caught in a rocky crevice, cuts the line and shoots up too fast, can't shout out in her face mask. She knows it's a risk going up too quick and feels a rupture in her ear. A howl of pain escapes from her and her face mask disappears. The goth twins have seen what's going down. One of them lights a flare, the others have forgotten about. The red light draws them to the surface slowly, save Athena who's thrashing like a fish caught in a net. Blue lights flash and Athena is hauled out and off to hospital. She's got the bends and Nula's got a perforated eardrum. The sound's punched out. At the hospital, there's no news. And Kathleen is praying for the fate of her child's best and only friend. She doesn't know what she would do and what would she do without her best mate. The hours go by and there's no word. Nula's pacing the ward and wobbly, no balance with one eardrum gone, the hate in her heart turning her to stone. And when they give her the news, the very worst news, she becomes what she always had the potential to become, the Godhead, the steely-eyed Gorgon, the Medusa reborn. 
They say I'm angry like I haven't got the right, like the snakes in my head sound too loud and too bright. They are drumming out the dead and then they're drumming out the light. Fury makes blood patterns shooting thoughts and sights. Of course I'm bloody angry, but that's not enough, not nearly enough. I am incandescent with rage and I can't understand why they don't think that's all right. That maybe is just a phase, a stage of growing up and getting on and accepting things have happened that weren't meant to be, but just are. Sorry, not bloody sorry. I can't do that. I can't accept the bar being so low that we have to step over it, not limber under. I'm sorry you can't accept my anger. And I'm sorry that my best friend is dead. It could have been avoided. It should have been avoided. It would have been avoided if things had been different. Different how, different who, different when. All of this is just over and over again. I can't cry anymore. I can only rage. It's all that I've got left. And I wish that you could see this. See how I'm bereft. Nuala's got no arms, but she just can't cry. And she's angry now, more angry than she's ever been. For Athena now, now she's going to get mean. Going to be more herself than she has ever been. And this town is going to see something they've never seen. She shakes out her salt long braids. Saturated with the sun god's fire, let the bright sparks of jelly stings crackle on her skin. The one with the welts and purple rivulets, curating the skin she's been living in. Rippling across her shoulders like a snake about to shed. No one will cross her now. No one shakes their head as they look at her wheel, the maggoty hate in her heart. How it takes hold, makes her lose reason, aim high and bold, snaking lines and curves of movement, dancing thoughts of revenge, spinning spiders in her head. The world is more whooshy and watery than it was. Ears singing like a seashell with damp down noise, losing balance to tinnitus, helps be in my own dark world. More to worry about than making friends, making reparations, making nice. When no one can look, she, who was one of two, they see her coming in windows, in mirrors, they block her gaze and turn away. None can speak to her while she wears this cloak of tragedy, wrong place, wrong time. Her grief is overwhelming, her silence immense. The twins turn their backs and stack books. The alpha girls can find nothing to say or giggle about. The boys stare at the floor. No girl looks directly at her as if they might turn to stone. Even Lissa, Lissa, who knows her best, has nothing to say, no comfort to give. No one shares this grief. They did not know Athena or want to. It's something like survivor guilt, labeled and writ large. It's all Nula's fault. Medusian la compagnie, they always were and shall remain. She won't look to Lissa again. She who has a heart still, though she could wish it wasn't so, wishes she could just let go. But no, no, no. Nula stands on the hill, looks out at the town, watching through her fingers like when she was a girl peeping through the arms of the statuary. The angels winged and lost, elaborate headstones, entwined arms of godmother's past, favoured hounds and horses, war sprites and words from the Bible. She and Athena used to come here to drink cider on the lots. They didn't care if it was disrespectful. These had their time over and now it was their chance. 
She thinks of her friend now, and the tears roll down, missing her so much she can't sing or even speak. But she's banned from the funeral and saying her last goodbyes. Her mother had to tell her, and Kathleen, she thinks it was the hardest blow, something so mean, her girl is suffering too. So she runs up the hill and hides her tears among the statues, thinks she'd like to sort a Viking funeral. A big wooden boat set on fire and sent out on the water, a dignified funeral pyre, thinks to herself. A boat is a harness, a link, between us and the all nature's watery slink. An unknowable force, ever movable body, with only the moon to tame and betide her, glinting at secrets and ever above her. A boat is a crib or a coffin, launched in hope or lament, Viking or cargo, a fire or a sleep. She whistles the wind to rock out the tides, all general tilt and lift, show and recover. A boat is a restless creature, full of breath and desire, a sway dance breeze of a red sail sliding, lifted up like hands to their prayers and a belief in higher powers, life entrusted to board and to flap. A boat is chasing the horizon all hours. Superstition her constant, blue lined keel and a carefree calling, born into a cool sea breeze, Anruhe and Fernve heeds a call to adventure, canary yellow deck, and a boat sails on, the blue ocean slaps. And now there's a man thinks he knows me, wants what's in my head. I can't think I believe him, think it's my body he wants instead. But I'm a blur of movement and so is he. Can't control his wanting and at least he wants me. At least I'm good for something. And it shuts out the snaking voices in my head. For a while I can think of something else than Athena's vivid smile. He says he's going to take care of me. And sometimes I wish he would. I've dropped out of school again just because I could. Mom wasn't happy, but Mom doesn't get a say. I'm old enough now to make my own way, and my man lets me stay at his. Home away from home. Oh, Mom can say she's disappointed. Didn't work all those hours so I can be a teenage mom. Stats on the side. She's spouting them in hate. I can't stay to listen and go, or I'll be late. Oh, he's got a temper, yeah. So what? It's true. At least he doesn't scare me or beat me black and blue. But I see a warning face staring in the mirror and have to cover up the truth. Can't stand her staring back at me with a snake tattoo rickling into muscle or grainy green and blue. And I wonder where she went, that girl I used to know. Cut off in her prime, says Kathleen. And I don't know what to do. A boy has turned her head and he's using her for sure. And I can't see the future standing on the shore. But it looks bleak for me and mine and I wanted to wake up. Look at your life and mine before she suddenly turned 40 and regrets what's done is done. Athena wouldn't want this for you and past love is gone. You should learn to honour her and get some self-respect. Leave this man who's no good for you and take time to reflect. Get back into college and start again. Of course they'll take you back. This time is so important and you don't get it back. You don't get it back. 
When I told him what was going down, he had a mental break, started cutting on me and my braids gone to snakes. Then I really was afraid and I thought he'd end me there, looking in the kitchen and kneeling on the stair. Thought I saw for a moment in my window reflection, Athena stood there waiting in a chamber for someone to do her hair. And then there was a blinding mirror flash. Some, too many somethings said aloud in anger, in all the unlacing brutal silences until what was bruising us and our lives together was all too much intensity, battling heads, crossing swords with each other's sanctity. One of us had to move or scream aloud the act and I knew I had to be the one, it was either him or me. It seemed such a mean low trick, I couldn't believe it real. I had to move and be so quick, but he was faster still. And then it was, he broke my neck upon the windowsill. I hope I haunt him all his days with the trophy of my head, redeemer of his dreams and the harbinger of dread. No mirror to look around or reflect the aegis on his shield. I was made for more than this, so much more than this, and only to Athena will I bend and yield. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I feel like that's such a powerful <laughs> reading. And um, we could actually all unmute and clap. I feel like we can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. The different voices really brings to life all the lyrical voices in it and the different ups and downs and especially the anger with Sophie. It was so gorgeous. So thank you everyone for bringing that to life. I wonder, Sarah, if you want to just tell us a little bit about what got you really excited about writing about Medusa and especially retelling it for today. Yeah, well, I've always enjoyed um, the Greek myths and the Greek stories. And I was looking for a tale. Um, there was a program, uh, Bedtime Stories for the End of the World. And I thought I might try something for that. And looking through, there just seemed to be uh, this story from Medusa. Everything happens to her. Uh, she doesn't have a lot of agency in her own story. Um, and I thought there, there was a real space there to tell a, a tale. And uh, this is what it became. And do you think there could be a Medusa for the stage? Because obviously I know you work that with Medusa really yeah. a lot before. And <laughs> <laughs> it could be in the works. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. Um, so if anyone wants to ask Sarah questions about this particular book, oh, Linda has actually. Linda Hill wonders, Sarah, would you write more from the female perspective for other tales? So she's referencing Ledger and the Swan, for example. Maybe, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, like I say, I am interested in the whole tapestry of Greek myth. There's so many great stories and um, often the uh, women don't have a say in their own stories. So there's definitely space there. And there's a lot of interest at the moment as well. Um, we've got people like Kate Tempest um, writing a lot in that area. You've got Stephen Fry's trilogy of books that have coming out. Uh, mythos heroes and troy is the next one that's coming out yeah. so okay. there's definitely interest there and like i say with uh, bedtime stories for the end of the world inua ellens um is a great writer um he, and he does uh, poetry and uh, stage work too there's a, a magnificent piece uh, the half god of rainfall um which you know taps into this kind of scene of stories Definitely. And I don't know if this is within your means, Sarah. Um, maybe it is because she did a gorgeous video recording of this a little while ago. But uh, Irene says, what about an animation? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I don't know how good that skill is. I do but... write in various different mediums. I haven't, haven't tried animation. Thanks for that, Irene. <laughs> <laughs> and Linda has a follow-up. So how important is the sea? And I know, obviously, you live quite near the sea at the moment. And so you in your personal life, because it seems such a powerful motif in the book. It, it really is. Um, I have a, another play that I, I work on on and off um, called Laradai, which is about a Yorkshire village that falls into the sea and a boy who falls in love with his sentient boat. 
Um, so there, there's quite a few pieces um, that uh, are inspired by the sea, definitely. And CJ says, what are your favorite sources for Greek mythology? So maybe what inspirations do you go to to find inspiration about Greek mythology? Hmm. <laughs> well, Stephen Fry's been really helpful because he's uh, collated <laughs> um, all the myths really into his mythos book. So uh, there, there's that. There, there's also, um, I mean, Shakespeare, uh, the first play of Shakespeare's I ever saw was Troilus and Cressida. Um, and that probably started me down the path of being interested in, in Greek myth because that's all about the Trojan War. Um, uh, I saw that when I was 11, which was probably a little bit young, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, I read some right interesting books when I was <laughs> maybe seven, <laughs> but no one ever told me I couldn't. So, you know, yeah. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> and just for your general interest, um, Irene says Natalie Haynes is bringing out a book about Medusa next year. So ah. it's bound to be on your <laughs> reading list, Sarah. Everybody writing about Medusa. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's so funny how that happens though, um, you suddenly get a vein of interest there, there's just something in the ether. Um, <laughs> yeah, well thank you for Everyone that. Everyone starts writing about it. Um, Eleanor says, what drew you specifically to Medusa and did you consider other strong women from Greek mythology, so Medea or Antigone? Uh, well Medea and Antigone, they're, they're really well known from the plays and they do have a voice. So I think I'm more drawn to uh, someone who doesn't um, and we, who we don't really hear from because it's fresh territory. Um, we, you know, we think about their stories, but um, there's a lot of scope there for your own interests and um, put, putting your own spin on it. Definitely more creative license because yeah, they don't exactly. have the voice. Yeah. Yeah. And Linda says, uh, when you hear others reading your work, do you find that there's a meaning which you initially maybe hadn't intended? And how does that make you feel when you hear your work read? Well, I, I'm a playwright, so I love it. <laughs> I love hearing my words read, um, you know, getting the voices back and then starting a discussion. Um, some of my favourite times have been in the rehearsal room, uh, just starting to pick apart text and uh, discuss it. Um, yeah, so I really enjoy it. <laughs> You're the kind of writer that can let go then, because I know um, as a theatre graduate that there were some writers that couldn't just give it to the acting troupe and the director and let it be. But um... <laughs> No, that, that's fine. I al always find it really interesting if um, a play has been done by one person and then is done by another, the echoes yeah. of the two productions. I think it's fascinating how they can get a similar Thing, but very very different um, but the echoes are similar so uh, that is a fascinating process definitely um, and I don't know have you seen any movie depictions of Medusa because uh, Susan wants to know what's your favorite one so you're gonna have to have watched two to answer this question <laughs> I haven't seen any so <laughs> no I, I couldn't say <laughs> probably okay, the one Susan in my head is gonna have to recommend <laughs> Um, and then Rosie Barrett says that she's always thought that Helen of Troy would make a good subject um, and she had a little a go a little while ago but it's still sort of workshopping so it didn't really uh, stand out. There is a good play about Helen of Troy, I think it might literally be called Helen of Troy. I saw it when I was quite little at the Royal Exchange but that one was very good. Um, yeah maybe, um, I, I don't know about Helen of Troy, she seems a bit one note to me. Um, <laughs> But there's not enough there to really kind of get your teeth into. Um, yeah, so as you say, I'm really spoilt and bored. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm telling of Troy, really. <laughs> Definitely more maybe fertile ground with Medusa then. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the Sinbad movies, Irene says, um, Ray, Harry House, and Snakes. <laughs> I mean, this is clearly one to watch because um, yeah, it she is, says it scared oh, her. And I quite like a horror movie, so if it's along that <laughs> vein of thought. 
so, um, so Sarah, I'm going to put you on the spot because, um, I mean, I always tell people why people should buy a book. Um, and obviously they should because it's a beautiful production and beautiful uh, lyricism by Sarah. But what would you like people to take away from the book if they do go out and grab a copy? Well, what I really liked on, on the back, um, I don't know if this was you did the... Uh... Oh, no, it's not on here. But someone called it a mythic puzzle. And I really love that because um, it, it is, as you read through, um, you can get all the echoes to the myth. Any reference to snakes, to mirrors, to other medusary type things that are in the ether that people generally know. Um, and you just pick up on as you read through. That, that's what I want people to take away, really. Amazing. Great. So we've got quite a short launch today, just because obviously, you know, it's a short reading and we don't want to interrupt it. Um, but it's been wonderful hearing all the thoughts and discussing bits of theatre, bits of poetry and how the two combine today. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm going to put thank some very links very in the chat. Time. Um, and yeah, just feel free to unmute and chat while I put lots of links in. We've also got a deal today uh, for the ebook uh, version. Um, there's a code jellyfish um, at the shop uh, coupon page. Um, and yeah, that book um, and the paperback is £5.99. We unfortunately don't get Sarah's mug, but Sarah has a really cool mug, which goes with it. <laughs> Maybe something that Sarah can do for big fans. <laughs> yeah and there's the book modeling <laughs> always feel like on these things i need an outro music just so everyone has some sort of like it while people are going and browsing or talking <laughs> mike says well done to all the performers this evening which i definitely want to reiterate because oh, that was beautiful the closest i'm getting to theater for a quite a while <laughs> which I'm very much missing. And Susan says thank you and she really enjoyed it. I'm just going to put the ebook code and then. And JL Corbett said it really brought it to life having the performance. And Claire says, the book looks beautiful, Sarah, which I feel like is almost when someone compliments your baby, so. <laughs> 